Hello everyone, this is Islam Sulaiman, his teammates Fadi Dawood, Habiba Jamal, and Muhammad Abdul Hamid, also known as Oscar. In our second and final progress presentation for this semester, we're going over a quick recap of our idea, our design and theoretical decisions, a progress overview of what we have done on the project so far, followed by some implementation details, then what we plan to do in thesis 2 this upcoming semester, what we expect are the outcomes, and finally, the demo of our project so far. Starting with a recap of our idea, we aim to build a generic machine learning system that satisfies the following properties. It should be fully decentralized, no central servers or any single points of failure. It should be efficient in terms of computation and communication load. We aim to meet all constraints with as low of communication overhead as possible. All the data used in the system is private. The data of one user isn't shared on the network, neither can be inferred by any other user, and the system should be fair. Only the participated users can make use of the system based on their contribution. So how do we do this? We depend on blockchain, which satisfies the decentralization and identity anonymity in the system. Our consensus algorithm ensures fairness and the validity of the model and its updates. Our network topology is in a fully connected one, which guarantees the efficiency of the system. And again, no data is being shared, so that's a check on the privacy. And we plan to use virtual currency inside the system as a support to system fairness. So why does our system rely on blockchain? There are four main reasons for that. It ensures the full decentralization of the system and the consensus algorithm of the blockchain is used to validate the model updates. The blockchain serves user anonymity and it's well known that blockchain is a great environment for cryptocurrency. And now I'll be leaving you with Habiba to go over our decisions. Now I'll describe some of the design and theoretical decisions that we've taken. I'll first start with describing the system structure. There are two main actors in the system, the trainer and the validator. The trainer performs training and the validator, of course, validates those updates. Uh, the flow and the interactions between the trainer and the validator goes as follows. The trainer first starts uh, training from the latest model. After training is done, it sends its updated gradients to the validator that, valido uh, that validates those updates. If the accuracy passes a certain threshold, then the transaction is accepted. If not, it is rejected. In both cases, it is checked if the training is done or not. If it's done, uh, then the flow ends. If not, then the training starts from the new model. In our system, we emphasize on the no data sharing to maintain the data privacy. This is why training is performed on the trainer's local data. The trainer then shares only its updated gradients with the validator. Validation is also performed on the validator's local data. This is why we have to rely on multiple validators as we cannot assume that a single validator is always trustworthy. This reliance on multiple validators removes the dependency on a single trusted entity. Since in our system we can have multiple validators, they cannot always agree on the same de decision regarding whether a, a transaction should be accepted or rejected. This is solved by the consensus algorithm. By the consensus algorithm, two-thirds of the validators have to agree on a transaction for it to be accepted. Since our system also supports having multiple trainers, we use a customizable minimum ratio of the trainers that must contribute before a new model is created. I also have to point out that in Exonym, a trainer shares its updates with a single validator that then propagates these updates with the rest of the validators in the network, as seen in the diagram. Since in our system, a validator can receive multiple updates from different trainers, there has to be a way to combine all these updates into a single new model. This is done through aggregation, which is the weighted average of the accepted updates. The weight of a trainer will be determined by the trustworthiness of the trainer. So far, I've spoken a lot about accepting or rejecting a transaction. So how is this determined? A model is accepted if its score passes a minimum passing score, which is a minimum required value of the score for the model to be accepted. 
This minimum passing score is updated each iteration by the validator. The validator sets it to be the multiplication of the decay constant and the score of the latest model. In our system, we want to incentivize legitimate collaborations, so we will use virtual cryptocurrency to reward trainers and validators. However, we also want to punish malicious nodes and limit their access. This is done through having a cost for collaborating. The aim behind this cost is to limit the access of nodes that are not trustworthy. Imagine the scenario for a malicious node. It will pay a cost to collaborate on the model, its collaborations will then deteriorate the quality of the model, so the node will not be rewarded. If the node keeps repeating this behavior over and over, it will eventually run out of coins and will not be able to collaborate or use any models in the system. And now to our progress overview. Now let's give an overall view of our progress uh, since the initial proposal presentation, uh, which generally revolved around creating or implementing the infrastructure uh, that we needed in order to conduct our research experiments. So uh, we started, of course, by um, our final selection for our uh, blockchain framework, which was Exonym. Uh, second, we basically extracted and adapted the relevant architectural pattern found in a typical Exonym project. And then on top of that, we defined our elementary objects, uh, including the model object, and uh, our transactions, um, including the transaction, the main transaction being uh, the update sharing. And um, next, we created a minimal machine learning compatible blockchain system, uh, which we uh, will demonstrate at the end of this presentation and on top of that we created uh, and implemented uh, many ac interfaces actually in order uh, to assist us in querying the system. Now let's go over our blockchain framework of choice, Exonym, and we're only going to be tackling the most relevant and uh, central part about any blockchain framework, namely being its consensus algorithm. And for Exonym, that algorithm is a variant of the uh, practical Byzantine fault tolerance family of algorithms, uh, which are actually the most common uh, type of Byzantine fault tolerance algorithms. And um, its core procedure to ensure decentralized consensus is through voting or elections. Now, of course, that comes with multiple assumptions. Uh, we're going to be talking about the three main ones. Uh, first, the, the validators are partially synchronous, which means that the, uh, their computational power is not uh, differing by much. And uh, the second assumption is that we're operating in a partially synchronous network, which means that all messages are guaranteed to be delivered after a finite yet possibly unknown time window. And the third assumption is that uh, strictly more than two-thirds of the validators are honest or are non-Byzantine. Um, that, uh, that is, of course, is the um, minimum majority ratio allowed uh, on the system. And uh, on the right, you can find the whole schema of um, the elections, how it happens. Uh, we're not going to get into the details of that. Uh, we're only going to be talking about the four main uh, consensus messages proposed is where a uh, round leader proposes a block to be added to the blockchain. Pre-vote, uh, which you can just consider as vote, uh, is when you consider a block to be valid and so you voted. And uh, pre-commit is when you make sure that all uh, the, the result of executing uh, the block transactions are the same across all validators. And then you finally do the block commit. Now, moving on to a modular view of our project as it currently stands, uh, there are actually two versions of this. Uh, the first version, the less realistic one, is uh, the all honest version, which uh, in which a validator assumes that all uh, trainers are honest, so it need not uh, do validation for their model updates. Uh, and so, as you can see, um, we have light clients. Light clients represent uh, the trainers. They're just uh, they're called light because they are just uh, responsible for transferring the weights uh, after training to the validator, and uh, uh, they communicate uh, with the validator through an HTTP endpoint. 
uh, then um, the, all their transactions are moved to the service handlers, which uh, ex are responsible for executing these transactions um, using the um, uh, like the construct of the storage schema in order to interface the local database. And then you can see on the left, uh, there's the wire API. This is used uh, for querying things about the information from the blockchain, basically. And now moving on to uh, the more realistic version of our architecture, uh, which handles the existence of Byzantine Uh, uh, proper training, they're just uh, station is done through the HTTP endpoint. But uh, in that version, uh, the HTTP endpoints first relays these transactions or these updates to a validation module uh, in order to verify uh, the performance of these or the quality of these gradients. Uh, that is, of course, using a local data set uh, only known to the validator itself, uh, not shared with, uh, with trainers. And um, then if, if that uh, transaction proves to be a valid one, in, then it is passed to the service handler, uh, just like before, and the flow continues normally. Uh, if they're not valid, they are just dropped, they are rejected. Uh, one uh, final thing to note about this is that uh, this only shows the case for one validator, uh, just to show how it looks on the inside, but of course the trainers are in reality connected to more uh, validators of a similar structure. So moving on, uh, this part explains how we uh, basically customize the default uh, consensus mechanism of Exynum in order to more reflect the um, purpose of our system. And uh, here, as you can see, uh, we have a group of validators uh, voting on whether a model should be added to the blockchain or not. Every one of them is testing the model using the local uh, test sets, and um, they're coming up with a verdict. If the majority uh, deems the model uh, to be a valid one, it is accepted and um, committed to the blockchain, otherwise it is dropped. Now let's talk about uh, some of the implementation details. Regarding the frameworks and programming languages we used, uh, we've selected Exynum as the blockchain framework since it has the option of a pluggable consensus. The goal was to customize it such that the validator nodes perform local validation followed by majority voting. We've selected Node.js, which is a JavaScript framework uh, for both clients and servers. Interfacing is easy in JavaScript because it is uh, very dynamic, and especially as the helper node packages by Exynum, like Exynum Client, are simple to use in JavaScript. Uh, for the programming languages, we use Rust for the blockchain infrastructure because it is one of the safest and most efficient programming languages. Uh, the, problem, uh, the problem is Rust is strict. Uh, it's strict because it's safe uh, and required a significant learning curve. Exynum is also written in Rust, so that's a benefit for Rust. Python, of course, is in charge of all machine learning operations due to the presence of imported libraries like TensorFlow and Keras for deep learning and scikit-learn for machine learning. Uh, we also use shell scripting for automating some tasks like the network initiation and other important uh, operations. Let's talk a little bit about Exynum. Uh, the Exynum blockchain is composed of a few different constructs and modules. The important ones are the protobuf module, the model construct, the transaction share updates construct, the schema construct, the service handling construct, and the API. I will now get into more details to describe the function of each construct. Uh, the protobuf module is used for serialization and deserialization for local storage. This is required for constructs that live on the blockchain. They must be serializable by protobuf. Uh, these constructs are going to be the model construct and the transaction share updates, which I'm going to explain next. The model construct is used to define the machine learning object and the operations performed on it. Uh, so it is the model that trainers are actually trying to improve. In our case here, the model is composed of a virgin number, a vector of weights that define this model, uh, the size of this vector, uh, its current score, and its next minimum score. The only operation that can be performed on it is aggregate, which simply adds a vector update to the model. The transaction share updates defines the update transaction created by a trainer and sent to a validator. In our case, the transaction is simply composed of a vector of update gradients and a random seed. 
The service construct defines the transaction handlers. We only have one handler because we have one type of transaction, the share of this transaction. Uh, this handler implements a listener that will trigger the aggregation and add a new block in the chain for this transaction. And also possibly update the model version. The schema construct is used to interface the local store for querying and other operations. In our case, the schema includes a function, update weights, the most important function, uh, which gets the updates as a parameter, aggregates them with the latest model, and then updates the local storage. This function is triggered by the service handler and acts as a mediator between this handler actually stored on the blockchain. The Y API is used to externally query the blockchain. Uh, in our case, we have three such APIs. The first is get model, which returns a model given its version number. The second API returns model info. This includes some information about the model, like the model history, including past transactions and proofs, uh, the block proof and the model proof. The third API is a helper that returns the most recent version number, which is important to enable trainers to start from uh, the most recent valid uh, starting point for the model. For demonstration, we will use the MNS dataset that is resized to be 20 by 20 pixels. The model itself we're going to be using is a convolutional neural network implemented uh, via Keras on top of TensorFlow. The flattened input layer is, of course, uh, 20 by 20 as uh, decided by the size of the images. And the output layer is 10 for 10 labels, 0 to 9. In all, there is a total of uh, 4,010 trainable parameters for this model. The light client, which is the programming object representing the trainer, takes a number of steps with each iteration. It fetches the latest model and uses it as a starting point for training on its own local data. After training, as already mentioned, the model gradients are generated and sent to the validator. On the other side, when the validator receives such update, it aggregates this update with the latest model and calls the validation script on. Based on the verdict of this validation, an update is either accepted or rejected. A validator also exposes the details of the blockchain as an API service, as we explained earlier, uh, using the wire API. For our plan next semester, we have five main objectives to go to. The first is adopting big size models, which will require the segmentation of model updates that is yet to be implemented. The second is to scale our system to be able to sustain more than one model along with the integration of the virtual cryptocurrency into the system. Then, we will deploy and test our systems on remote machines. And with all this, there are some research questions that needs are investigated to go in our research paper. Now I'll go into more details about our empowerment outcome. The outcome of this project is a research paper. Our progress towards this outcome is that we have built a pro the prototype and the infrastructure needed for the experimentation and future development. Uh, we've conducted a simple experiment to deduce the performance of the decentralized uh, system compared to the centralized system. We did this by plotting the accuracy versus the number of iterations for both the centralized and the decentralized systems. This plot shows that the decentralized system outperformed the centralized system. This is a very promising result as it shows that we can get the benefits of the decentralization without sacrificing the quality of the model. Uh, this experiment was carried out using 5% batch size. Um, uh, one iteration is composed of one training epoch. Uh, the validation carried out for the centralized and the decentralized model were performed on the same validation set. Uh, of course, for the centralized system, uh, there was only one trainer, but for the decentralized system, uh, there were four trainers. We have also identified possible experiments to carry out during Senior Project 2. For instance, we want to study the effect of the trainers to validators ratio on the overall performance of the model. If we have too many validators, then we're wasting computing resources that could have been better utilized in training. And if we have too little validators, then we're sacrificing the quality of the model. In addition, we want to study the effect of the weight of the trainer on the performance of the model. And we also want to determine the best way to calculate uh, the weight of the trainer given its trustworthiness. We also want to uh, investigate the effect of the initial model weights and the initial minimum passing score on the performance of the model. 
and we want to determine the ratio of trainers to wait for before creating a new model because if we wait for too many trainers then the system will be slow and if we wait for too little trainers then we're wasting the computing resources of the slightly slower trainers. We also want to experiment with the number of epochs per iteration and the batch size per iteration. We want to examine the effect of the value of decay, which is used to calculate the minimum passing score on the overall performance of the model. And we want to compare the statically assigned decay uh, uh, constant versus a dynamically changing decay constant that, for instance, depends on the number of iterations elapsed. All right, so here we have our first demo scenario in which we uh, demonstrate the normal training process, assuming that all trainers are honest, so no Byzantine trainers, no Byzantine behavior, anything, uh, which will be uh, actually demonstrated in the second scenario. So on the left, we have uh, our two validators, um, and on the right, we have our four trainers, so let's go ahead and start them. So uh, we should be able to see the uh, results of uh, the training process on, on the uh, left part of the screen, uh, specifically on the validator side. So here we have our four updates from um, our four trainers for this round, for the first round, or in the first model version. Uh, so you can see that version one was released. Um, one thing to note about this is that this accuracy was evaluated using an external uh, test set. Um, so this was just for demonstration purposes to evaluate the model from the outside. Um, and also another thing to note is that the validators, because they're assuming uh, trust, they are not uh, validating the actual contents of the uh, dates. Uh, so here we have uh, version one. For version one, we had an accuracy of 80.5%. We had uh, for version two, 84.16%, uh, which is a step up from the previous one. Um, then 85, roughly 86, um, then for the next round, we should be, um, we should start now, yes, uh, so we have two, we received two updates, three updates, and then uh, I think we can, it's sufficient to show up to maybe version 5, um, just to show a significant growth in the model accuracy, um, yes, so... Well, the, the round five has started, and um, where's the, here's all the updates. So th these are just verified for, for identity, not actually for content, as I uh, mentioned. And uh, yeah, I think we can stop at version five just to uh, save time. And uh, thank you. We'll uh, be demonstrating the second scenario right after this one, where we'll be, where we'll be handling uh, Byzantine behavior. Basically. So, thank you. Alright, so now we have our second demo scenario in which we uh, basically demonstrate the handling of Byzantine fault tolerance or Byzantine behavior. Um, so in, the, in this scenario, we have only one validator uh, on the left and we and on the right we have four trainers, one of which, particularly this one, uh, is actually an imposter uh, trainer that isn't that isn't really doing actual training. It's just uh, sending garbage uh, updates or garbage values. Uh, so let's go ahead and start uh, our validator instead on the Byzantine mode. So uh, it's now running, and then we um, run all the trainers, and this is the imposter mode. So uh, in this scenario, we aim to demonstrate the validation of each uh, trainer transaction by the validator uh, to judge basically whether it is uh, actually valid or done by an imposter. So we can see that the first um, update received was actually received um, from the imposter uh, and was ruled out invalid, of course. Uh, so it was rejected. Uh, the other three were accepted, uh, as you might expect. And uh, we managed to reach our, reach our first model um, with that accuracy, so that's not bad. Um, now we go to the next round. Uh, basically, we uh, have created the first one and we're moving to the next bunk. Um, so yes, of course, the uh, imposter update was rejected and the other three pass. 
So we should be getting version two now. Here it is. Um, it's a step up, of course, from the from the predecessor um, in terms of accuracy, and um, it goes on like this. Uh, we can um, we can wait for more rounds, but um, yeah, this this is essentially uh, the behavior we intended to demonstrate that the validator is handling the uh, is validating every uh, trainer update. Um, so yes, I believe we can stop here.